Welcome to our micro learning course about checklists in general aviation. The course consists of three short modules. This first module is an introduction to checklists and it includes an interesting story about how aviation checklists came to be. Module 2 deals with the effective use of checklists and such things as which checklists are needed and what to do if you are interrupted while running a checklist. Module 3 concerns modifying or creating checklists to make them right for the individual and for the operation. It is not essential, but I recommend that you view the modules in sequence. So let's begin with a discussion of checklist basics. Today, checklists are used in many different industries for many different functions. The medical profession has embraced the use of checklists to help prevent errors, particularly in surgery and in surface transportation operations, and in many other industrial applications. Sometimes checklists are printed, and sometimes they are electronic. We didn't always have checklists. Let's take a quick look at their origin. To do that, we will back up to 1935. Boeing introduced their brand new Model 299 bomber, which was to become the famous B-17. On October 30th, 1935, at Wright Airfield in Dayton, Ohio, the U.S. Army held a flight competition for airplane manufacturers vying to build its next-generation long-range bomber. It wasn't supposed to be much of a competition. In early evaluations, the Boeing Corporation's Model 299 had outscored the designs of Martin and Douglas. Boeing's planes could carry five times as many bombs as the Army had requested. It could fly faster than previous bombers and almost twice as far. The flight competition was to be merely a formality. The Army planned to order at least 65 of the aircraft. A small crowd of Army brass and manufacturing executives watched as the Model 299 test plane taxied onto the runway. The plane roared down the tarmac, lifted off smoothly, and climbed sharply to 300 feet. Then it stalled turned on one wing, and crashed in a fiery explosion. Two of the five crew members died, including the pilot. An investigation revealed that nothing mechanical had gone wrong. The crash had been due to pilot error, the report said. Substantially more complex than previous aircraft, the new plane required the pilot to attend to the four engines, a retractable landing gear, new wing flaps, electric trim tabs that needed adjustment to maintain control at different airspeeds, and constant speed propellers whose pitch had to be regulated with hydraulic controls, among other features. While doing all this, the pilot had forgotten to release a new locking mechanism on the elevator and rudder controls. The Boeing model was deemed to be, as the newspaper put it, too much airplane for one man to fly. The Army Air Corps declared Douglas's smaller design the winner. Boeing nearly went bankrupt. Still, the Army purchased a few aircraft from Boeing as test planes, and a group of test pilots got together and considered what to do. They came up with a simple but previously untried approach. They created a pilot's checklist with step-by-step -step checks for takeoff, flight, landing, and taxiing. We know the rest of the story. The Boeing Model 299 became the B-17 and went on to great glory in World War II. And we know that the Boeing Company has prospered and not gone bankrupt. The use of checklists rapidly spread throughout the military and the practice was also incorporated by the airlines. But general aviation has been very slow in embracing the advantages of fully using checklists. We could argue for hours on what should be on any given checklist and exactly which checklists are needed. That's precisely the point of this series. The checklist has to be something that the pilot is comfortable with and has confidence in. We can start with any publication that the manufacturer provides and then expand from there. Obviously, we must be realistic about our checklists. The checklist is a tool to help us fly better and safer. It isn't an end in itself. Checklists must never get to the point where they interfere with flying the airplane. But that brings up a criticism of using checklists, or perhaps an excuse not to use them at all. We will explore that and learn more about the effective use of checklists in the next module. 
We have completed Module 1, Checklist Basics. Continue this micro-learning series with Module 2, Effective Use of Checklists, and Module 3, Modifying or Creating Checklists. Links to all the modules plus more aviation safety videos can be found on GeneBenson.com.